Hello there, and welcome to Compass. Stan Savage fought at Gallipoli. He saved more than 50,000 Assyrian refugees from certain death in the Middle East of the time. And he went on to found Legacy, an organisation still providing aid to families of Australian servicemen and women. In an extraordinary military career, Stan became Lieutenant General Sir Stanley George Savage, one of our most decorated soldiers. Compass tracks down the man behind the legend. These are his photos when he first joined us at the end of Kapuka. So he was in a fresh face. My husband was deployed to Afghanistan in 2011. He was probably about mid-deployment when he got sent to like the training facility. So they were training the Afghan army to take over. And my husband was out on parade that day and um, an Afghan soldier just, they don't know why, he just came out and opened fire and killed my husband, um, killed two other um, soldiers. When Jacqueline's husband, Luke, was killed in Afghanistan four years ago, Legacy stepped in to give their support. Hi, how are you? Hi. Can I play with your play You're going to hide, are you? You're going to be shy today. Are you going to show Eric how you can make your Play-Doh people? No. Today, her Legacy, as Legacy calls their volunteers, is Eric Easterbrook. I've got, got plenty of time, I'll bring you one over. <laughs> I mean, um... I believe in supporting families of, of our service people who have um, come across misfortune, whether they've been killed in action or died subsequent to it. Oh. Yeah, so have you got this book? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll go get it. I'll go um, get it. Okay. He's a godsend. Comes over and just checks up on me. So if I'm having a really down day, he'll come and have just have a cup of tea. Doesn't, you know, push me to find out what's wrong. Um, just generally cares. Yeah. yeah, no, I often dream about him. Yeah. And the kids do. Yeah. Joshua does a fair bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. Is he all right now? Yeah, all right so far. Yeah. There are around 6,000 legatees in Australia, providing financial and emotional support to 90,000 widows and 1,900 children. All credit to its founder, Stan Savage, who started Legacy more than 90 years ago. But that's only part of the life of this remarkable man. I think the Stan Savage story, particularly World War I, is a very undertold story. Uh, there are groups within the Australian community that actually regard Stan Savage as a saint. The, the Assyrian community who were essentially saved uh, by Stan, Savage, Stan Savage's actions uh, high, hold him in high regard. There are about 30,000 Assyrians in Australia. They claim descent from the earliest civilizations of the Middle East. As Christians in their homeland, they've been persecuted for centuries. Many here claim direct lineage from Stan Savage's rescued refugees of World War I. Stan Savage uh, was, uh, I think, not only myself, but my parents and all my family are uh, really, really our existence to, to him. Probably none of us would have survived. From that little diary, you get all of this. This is what um, Captain Savage wrote as his experiences on paper. Gabby Kiwakis, an Assyrian who served in the Australian Army in the late 70s, was delighted to discover his ancestors had been rescued by an Australian. He was a rare man who, by fate, became a soldier. And for the Assyrians, thank God, that he became a soldier. Otherwise, we'd all been wiped out. When Sarah Lindenmeyer heard about Stan Savage, she was inspired to write a book about World War I and the Middle East. It had never occurred to us that there were, were Anzacs fighting in Persia in the First World War. I found this very intriguing and 
I thought this really should go on the public record. This needs to be told. It's September 1915. On Gallipoli, the Allied campaign is collapsing. A new arrival, Private Stan Savage, shows clear leadership and is soon promoted to captain. He'd been a scoutmaster and Sunday school teacher back in Melbourne. Intrigued by the stories of the Bible, he had his heart set on becoming a Baptist minister when war intervened. At 25, he'd delayed volunteering for a year, worried about his fiancée, Lillian. So they were engaged before he decided to go off to fight. And, and uh, the reason he didn't marry Lillian beforehand was he was very, very concerned about her becoming a young widow. So he didn't want that for her. There's Stan there. That's me. John Savage is Stan's nephew. We got that correct. As a boy, He'd heard all of Stan's war stories, like the evacuation of Gallipoli in December 1915. He's now, I, I understand, recorded as being last off. He had just been commissioned as a captain and they said, right, go and earn your commission, make sure everyone's off. And would you believe, and I remember he used to joke about this, he said, we do all the thing, he said, get down to the beach, and he said, they'd all gone. <laughs> and said, we were stranded, so. When he arrived on Lemnos Island, the evacuation point, the Colonel was shocked to see him um, and didn't think that they'd actually made it off the peninsula at all. The build-up of forces on the Somme is joined by the Australians. Their forces now 100,000 strong. After surviving Gallipoli, there was the horror of war on the Western Front. Now the Australians face the full fury of battle. Drum fire, so fierce that no single report is heard. Stan was a remarkable soldier and on New Year's Day 1918 was awarded the Military Cross for conspicuous gallantry and exceptionally good service. He was very, very brave. He saw a lot of terrible things going on around him. He was also involved in some fairly brutal incidents. So we have this very quiet, modest, gentleman, Sunday school teacher, scout leader on the one hand, and a, and a really um, a soldier who was capable of some very um, brutal hand-to-hand um, -hand combat with the Germans. Then Stan heard about an intriguing offer from the British High Command. They were looking for officers, particularly from the colonies, with proven courage, leadership and adaptability to form a special operation of unspecified nature. This is how Stan described it in his memoirs. A desperate venture which will probably cost you your lives, but if successful will mean everything at this stage of the war to the British Empire. Stan became part of the officer group of the 300-strong Dunster Force. It was named after their commander, General Lionel Dunsterville. They set off by rail through France and then by ship through the Suez Canal, finally landing at Basra in British-held Mesopotamia. And it wasn't until you know, they got to, to Basra that they had some idea of what their mission was. Of course, they were given lessons in 
learning both Persian and Russian language, special weapons training, it was only once they started to move up towards Baghdad that you know, their task was revealed to them. Their job was to defend the overland routes to India from the Germans and their Ottoman Turk allies. Their destination, the northwest of what was then known as Persia. As Dunsterfors sailed up the Tigris River, Stan wrote about how this ancient waterway reminded him of the Bible stories of his Sunday school days. Ahead, lay hundreds of kilometres of gruelling mountains to cross. I think it was an unbelievably difficult experience. They had to subsist off the land as they were going. They had a very large train of mules and horses crossing over a pebbly desert with these animals and their very heavy packs, then going up into extremely high mountains with very steep ravines for months on end. Considering that they'd survived Gallipoli and the Western Front and were already physically very uh, run down, so this, this journey was extremely arduous for them. As they passed through the country, Dunster Force boosted its numbers by recruiting local men into resistance squads. With no maps for reference, Stan's role was to go on ahead and to find existing guerrilla forces who were already operating further north. On one of these patrols, something completely unexpected turned up. On their way, they, they came across a very large number of uh, refugees who had been harassed by the Turkish army. And these turned out to be Assyrian people and they were fleeing from the lake side city of Ermia, which is their provincial capital in, in northern Persia. There were many, many thousands of Assyrians were racing down through the mountains, carrying everything they had with them on their backs and with their animals and their sheep and their herds and their children and all of their elderly to get away from the Turkish army who were trying to kill them. The Assyrians, like other Christians in this troubled region, had already suffered mass killings and forced relocations earlier in this war. Now, their last haven in northern Persia was under attack, forcing them to flee yet again. It's thought there were more than 60,000 refugees. Andrew Rohan's parents amongst them. My mother was only 18 months at that stage. My father was 15. And they told us stories of what Stan Savage uh, actually did. He saw some uh, either old or women, they couldn't walk. He put her on his own horse and he was walking. Um, these are, I mean, uh, these are stories that we heard. It was here Stan had to confront the reality that some of the starving refugees resorted to killing Persian villagers in the search for food. Yet he felt compelled to help. So he pleaded with the British High Command that he could go and rescue them. That was denied and eventually, and the story is perhaps he disobeyed um, commands, but eventually he did either get permission or, or he went to go and, and try and rescue these people. If you look at Captain Savage at the time, as an officer, his decision should have been, let's turn back, there's nothing we can do. Or let's lead these people to safety. But he didn't. He took a few men with him and he rode past the last refugee and he placed himself as a target. He actually says that. In his words, he says, 
I want the Turkish commander to concentrate his fire on me, to kill me before he gets to these poor refugees. As well as a few Assyrian fighters, Stan had just eight soldiers under his command, but he did have the latest weaponry and some very clever tactics. He masked the size of his small force when he moved by creating a lot of dust with his horses. And so the advancing Ottomans had no idea really uh, how big his force was. On one occasion, as the, the Ottomans were approaching a ridge line where he got the refugees over the ridge line, he got his eight troops to light campfires all the way along this ridge line so that as the Turks, the Ottomans uh, approached, they basically thought half the British army had turned up and sort of turned and this bought um, savage and, and refugees, you know, more valuable days to get further away. Thousands of the refugees perished on the way. The rest arrived in Baghdad some weeks later where they could start a new life. But for Stan, the effort nearly finished him off. He was at the point of complete and utter collapse and fatigue himself, and his heart was about to literally give up because he had actually been gassed in, in the Western Front. He nearly died himself and was evacuated down the mountains to Baghdad. And he was recuperating in hospital for many, many weeks. And when he finally came to and regained consciousness, he, he found that the war had come to an end. So it was just prior to armistice, actually, in, in November 1918. He came back to his fiancée, Lillian, who had been very anxiously and patiently waiting for him to come home safely, which, which he did. So they got married um, in the middle of 1919. When he got back, no work. And he tramped around Melbourne like all the rest of them. And he got very despondent and upset and uh, that started to change his thoughts, particularly about religion and what he saw and coming back home you know, we fought for the, our country and can't get work. But I can remember him quite often saying it, it really changed his idea, he said I still believe in God but you know, where is he? Stan eventually found work as a wool salesman and did so well that he built a beachside house for Lillian and their baby girl, Gwen. But he still grappled with the horror and excitement he and his mates had experienced in the war. He was contacted by his former commander, General uh, John Jellybrand, who had set up a, a remembrance club in Tasmania and was essentially uh, getting his junior captains together like Savage to say you should be doing something similar in Melbourne. In 1923, Stan and his war mates met at Anzac House in Melbourne's Russell Street to launch their new organisation, Legacy, as a club for ex-servicemen to support each other. And their vision for what this group of people would do eventually they settled on the task of looking after uh, the women and children of their mates that, that didn't come back. They had no source of funding except what came from their pockets. So Stan and Lillian opened up their beach house to give bereaved children a much needed holiday. Oh yes, well, um, the house down at Summers, big old thing down on the beach and 
They were boys and girls, not together, separate, and uh, very well organised along military lines. Now they're up early in the morning and had set duties to do. Had to make their beds, which were pelliasses, so they had inspections every morning by the general. <laughs> so yeah, it's very, very strict, but when he went off, <laughs> he tore strips off me a couple of times. For, yeah, but, but other than that, he was very calm, very benevolent, very generous with his money, and he made a lot of money in the business, but put all his money into legacy. Weekends, the house was full of people, big lunches, big dinners, drinks, and what have you, so, yeah, big, big entertainer. I think, you know, Stan was then calling back on his scouting experience as they developed activities to assist the kids. That grew into things like helping them with medical needs and dental needs, and as they got bigger and more organised, they became quite a, uh, an organisation that could provide a, quite a degree of assistance to these families. When the Second World War was declared, Stan, now a commander in the volunteer militia, willingly went to war again. But this time among regular army officers who were trained in modern warfare. I think during the Second World War, there may have been some jealousy. The fact that he'd come up through the ranks and that he hadn't been an officer from the start, so there was some disagreement there about his his abilities and his skills because he hadn't hadn't really undertaken that officer training at a younger age. Now a brigadier, Stan Savage was reprimanded for his tactical weakness at the Battle of Bardia in North Africa. Throughout the war, in Greece, Palestine and New Guinea, he was constantly criticised by his fellow officers, but his men loved him. He was a, a soldier's soldier, and he was a very kind man as well, so his, his, his men knew that. And at the end of World War II, the Japanese Admiral actually surrendered to, to General Stanley Savage. That's his KBE, CB, DSO, Military Cross, mentions in dispatches. When he came back, he was a very sick man. He was all gaunt and drawn. I was quite taken back the way he looked. Where was I? Let me big robust. <laughs> Meanwhile, legacy had become well established across Australia. Every year, legacy children paraded on Anzac Day, promoting the virtues of the organisation. When we see those rows of hundreds or even thousands of children doing calisthenics, the girls doing dancing, it gave a sense of belonging to a group. And for people who have been orphaned, you know, belonging to a sense to a group, you know, is a very powerful thing. This was a time of change and new ideas, and it didn't suit the ageing Stan Savage. So then there was a bit of a, a bust up with legacy and a fallout with everything. There was a change to it, the, the new brigade, rather than having the the camp and this sort of rough life the kids were made to have. They came up with the idea of, we'll billet them in various houses. Um, so and so and so down at Sorrenti or Portsea. And he wouldn't have a bar of that. And that was the, probably a sad end to his legacy life.
but he still remained the face of legacy. In 1953, the newly knighted Sir Stanley George Savage and Lady Savage represented legacy at Queen Elizabeth's coronation in London. When they came back, Auntie Lil died suddenly. It's an unfortunate, and that really shook him. And he lived two more months after that and just knocked the tripe out of him. Stan died in May 1954. But his spirit lives on. This is the legacy office for Sydney. Each week they hold a lunch for the local volunteers. Guests and legatees, welcome to our lunch today. Every year, Legacy raises around $17 million and is supported by 650,000 hours of volunteer work to help war widows and their children. I love doing it and uh, we get a lot of joy out of meeting wonderful people like Jackie and the kids. How are you, Josh? It doesn't matter day or night, if I call Eric up, he's there. What are you making, Libby? My kids have always played a lot of sport and after Luke died, you know, I, there's no way I could afford to pay for what they do. Um, but because of legacy, they're able to do it. You know, I can't thank them enough. What he's achieved in his life is a great soldier and a, a gentleman warrior and establishing this amazing organisation, Legacy, which continues to care for Australian veterans and their children. His legacy is what speaks loudest.